They say the two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. Well, you, you and I, we were meant to be free. And now God invites you to a soul-shaking, chain-breaking, life-giving adventure with your closest friends. We will share our stories of struggle and bravely explore the uncharted places of our soul. We will do this together and promise one another we won't stop until we are free. Liberation awaits. Today, freedom calls out your name. This is the way, the new way to be free. Let's have a word of prayer together. I don't know if you um, get into a service like this and you kind of think, oh, we're just kind of going through some motions. But actually, before we speak, there's a reason we all pray. And what I'm asking you to do in this moment is for you to basically quiet your heart, quiet your mind, shut down all the visual stimulus and all the things happening around you, and just for a moment, to quiet yourself and say, Lord, is there something you have for me today that I absolutely must have? And right before we get started here, that's what this conversation's about. It's about the time we quiet our hearts, quiet everything around us, and for a moment say, God, I believe you are real, I believe you exist, and I need you in my heart and life. And so if there's a moment, if there's something for me, then allow it to happen. And when I'm praying in this moment, just like this, I'm asking God to take front and center stage. Not a person, not what one man has to say, but that God would actually hide me in the cross and he would speak to all of us through his word. And so this moment isn't just something we do kind of every week as a kind of a matter of ritual or routine. It actually has some significant and poignant meeting, and so I ask that you would do that. In the next few moments, just quiet your heart, open your heart to what God would have you say, or what God would have you hear, and let him speak to you. Thank you, Lord, for all that. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for speaking to us in your name, amen. Well, um, we're in this series called Freeway, and today I was kind of wanted to tell you about something I've been thinking about this week. Um, I w- I've been thinking a little bit about labels and how we tend to put people in labels or put labels on people. See if you think about this is true. Um, so like, um, I put people in labels because then that tells me whether or not I like you. But I also put people in labels because that tells me whether or not I, I, that I don't like you. <laughs> and so I actually made a list this week, on, on, and I just went through Facebook. And I wrote down all these labels that I just saw on Facebook. And it was so discouraging, I, I cut it from the message. Because it was like, man, our labels are powerful, and our labels are, are carry so much emotion with them. We have all of these different labels that we put on people, I accept you or I reject you, all based on these labels, and, and whether we like it or not, we all tend to do this. And I was thinking about a time when Lisa was in medical school, and um, they had a party, and so all the medical students had a party, and all the spouses came, and it was basically this time to kind of vent and let off some steam from all the hard work they were going through. So we were at the party together, and we were staying in this huge circle of people, and we were all laughing and carrying on, and a lot of liquid courage was flowing, you know, and everybody was just kind of letting some steam off, and, and Lisa and I were trying to let some steam off with our Diet Coke, you know, and trying to have a, just a good time, and we're all carrying on, telling jokes and all this stuff. Well, then uh, somebody did, asked the drink question. <laughs> and it always happens whether I'm on an airplane or whether it happens whether I'm at a ball game or, you know, we're having some great relationship building and friends are building. And they'll say, so Tom, what do you do? 
And I know what's going to happen. I've done it so many times, and I just have to decide what I'm going to, how I'm going to handle it. Do I soft pedal it, or do I bring the hammer? <laughs> and I just have to sort of decide. And so before Lisa could stop me, I said, I help people avoid living in the realm of Satan, a lake of fire where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> <You know. laughs> and let me tell you, when there's liquid courage in you, that scares you to death. Actually, what I said was, I'm a pastor, but you would have thought I said what I just told you people. I mean, we were standing there holding our liquid cup and said, well, I'm a pastor. And man, there was like instant, like, whoosh, you know, vacating of the premises. I mean, within a minute, Lisa and I are standing there just looking at each other. And we're losers at the party because she brought the pastor with her, you know. It was kind of that moment. And I understand, I understand, because what happens is that there are labels that are put on pastors, and I understand that. You know, we all have labels. You probably have labels for what you do in your life as well. And it's just kind of this nasty sort of reminder that we all carry these labels and have these labels. The interesting thing is this. I was thinking about, what is it, what about when we start to believe the labels that we carry? <laughs> what if we start to believe those? So like someone told you some time ago, you're smart. Or someone told you you're dumb, or you're pretty, or you're ugly, or you're capable, or there's no way you will ever be able to do that, or you're too thin, or you're too fat, or you're not good enough. Oh, you are so good. And we begin to form identities around these labels. B -b -b but what about, what if the labels are wrong? What if we're forming entire identities around these labels that are wrong? And we're driven by these things that are wrong. What if we picked up a label from somebody who wasn't healthy to begin with? Who just felt like they should tell you something about your life? And what if they're not healthy at all? But you and I pick that label up, man, and we just put it in our pocket, and we carry that thing around forever. And we'll live an entire life. We'll parent our children. We'll love our spouse out of a label that may not even be true. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and so I got to thinking, maybe we should look at that. What Billy Graham said was this, what really matters is how God sees me. He isn't concerned with labels. He con he's concerned about the state of a man's soul. And there's something about that that sounds like truth to me. And so that's what I want to kind of mine after this, this morning. Um, everybody in the room, um, no matter where we are, no matter whatever, you know, our, our history is, we all, we all have this understanding. And what I want to go after about who we are, and what I want to go after this morning is, what is our truth identity? Now, I'm not talking about the way someone has said something about you. I'm not talking about the way you, your label that you have picked up. I'm saying, cut all that crap, and what's the truth identity? What's the true part of me? Because that's what you want to build a life on. That's what you want everything to circulate around. What is the truth identity? Because here's what I would suggest. One of the greatest challenges that Christians face is trusting what God says about us versus trusting what we believe about ourselves or what someone has told us about ourselves. Now see, you all have the face that all three services have had today so far. Tom, you're coming out of the gate like a fire hydrant that has just been cut open and I just am trying to get coffee and seated. I, I, no. So let me read this to you again because this, this is significant. One of the greatest challenges that we face as Christians is trusting what God says about us versus trusting what we believe about ourselves or what someone has told us about ourselves. I want to begin the discussion by looking at a story. It's found in Genesis 29, and it's a story about a guy named Isaac. He marries a woman who's named Rebekah. They have two sons, Jacob and Esau. Esau's older just by a few minutes, and the reason that's important is that means Esau, he is the firstborn, so he gets all the money and gets all the power and all the birthright stuff. So then Jacob grows up. He's basically neglected by his father. Esau loved to hunt and fish, and, and, and so his father was all into that. And so they kind of had this bond. And as a result, Jacob sort of has this unhealthy bond with his mother. 
One day, Jacob, with the help of his mom, robs Esau of his birthright. You have to read this all for yourself. By deceiving his dad, Isaac, and as a result, Jacob gets the birthright, and Esau says, I'm going to kill Jacob. And so Jacob does what every little brother does when the older brother says, I'm going to kill you. He runs. <laughs> and so Jacob runs and runs away. Now, interestingly enough, Jacob runs from his mama to his mama's brother, who was called Laban. Everybody with me so far? And this is where he picked the story. Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. By the way, Leah means cow. It's in the Bible. If your name is Leah, you're a beautiful person, I am sure. But I'm just saying what it says. The name of the younger was Rachel, which means you or sheep. A little farm animal action here. So <clears throat> now the reason that is sort of helpful to us is because of what comes next. In verse 17, it says this, Leah had weak eyes. Now we don't know what that means, but then you got to look at the contrast. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. So whatever the opposite of lovely in form and beautiful is weak eyes. So that's weak eyes. Jacob was in love with Rachel, the sheep, and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban says, it's better that I give her to you than some other man, which I guess is a blessing on the marriage. I don't really know. So stay here with me. So Jacob serves seven years, gets Rachel, and seemed like a few days because he loved her. Now this sounds really nice, and it sounds like Valentine's Day. It is not. Jacob is one messed up man. He's a messed up individual. He spent his whole life trying to get his father's love, and he never got it, ever. And then he's got a weird relationship with his mom that's really on the board, you know, the edge of freaky, because, you know, mom is actually closer to her son than she is to her husband, and she's a mom who played obvious favorites, and then he's got a brother who's trying to kill him. Now, Jacob would have interpreted all of this as God hates me, or God is not smiling on me. I don't have God's blessing. That's how he would have handled all this. So what Jacob thinks is this. If I could just get that one girl who is lovely in form and beautiful, if I could just get that one girl, then everything would be fine. She would be able to fix all of this. Never heard that before you. <laughs> she would be able to fix all of this, and it would make, him, make me whole and make me complete. Uncle Laban picks up on all this nut stuff, and so he's going to trick him. Verse 22, Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. And evening came, he took his daughter Leah, old weak eyes, and he gave her to Jacob. And Jacob lay with her. When morning came, there was Leah. Apparently, Jacob had weak eyes too. I'm just saying. So Jacob said, <laughs> So Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? <laughs> this is one of those times in the Bible, you know it's not what he really said. Because <laughs> that sounds like Shakespeare. What is thou hast done to me? You know, that kind of thing. And said, he slept with old weak eyes, you know what I'm saying? Like, this would be, he's upset. He said, I served you for the sheep, for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? And now I got old weak eyes here. Now, if you know how the story ends, Jacob tells his uncle, well, I'll work another seven years so I can marry Rachel. And he does. He ends up marrying Rachel, and it's an absolute disaster. Because he's fixed all of his meaning, purpose, and love on getting this one woman. Now, I told you that story all because of one sentence I read in a commentary this week. <laughs> his entire identity became about his obsession for her. Derek Kidner writes this. This whole story is a miniature of our disillusionment. For no matter what we put our hopes in, in the morning, it's always Leah, never Rachel. There's a lot of truth to that, isn't there? These things in life that we think are going to complete us, that we spend all of our lives, we just got to live in that neighborhood and drive that car and wear those clothes and get that job and marry him and marry her and have a kid and all these things that we think are going to complete us, but they never do. They never do. And we think they are and that they're going to be our identity. This is who we are and the labels we strive for and we put everything into. And one day you wake up and you realize it's not what you thought it was going to be. You got everything you were trying to get and now you realize it's not what you thought it was going to be. 
And Jacob is this man throughout his entire life who's driven by fear, insecurity, and some kind of false identity. And honestly, that's what a lot of us are driven by. Fear and insecurity and some kind of false identity. I'm not worthy, and I'm not accepted, and I'm not somebody. And and that bleeds over into faith. And now it's just that you weren't enough to your dad to be proud of, or you weren't perfect enough to get your husband's love, or you weren't talented enough to be noticed by your friends. But now you begin to think, I think God loves me, but I'm pretty sure he's disappointed in me. Because when you're driven by insecurity and fear, not only do you not measure up to the expectations of other people around you, But in your mind, you don't measure up to God's expectations either. And that is all why this matters. Because the truth identity says this. I am not, I am not defined by my labels or the labels of other people, but only by God's love. Now, that is such a massive, deep truth, it's hard for any of us to comprehend in this moment. What would it be like if my entire life and how I felt about it was only measured by God's love? So last weekend, a couple dozen folks give their heart to Jesus for the first time, and then a couple of, few dozen more said, I'm putting down the stone and trying to kind of let that go, forgive, I'm working on forgiveness. And I was thinking about you all this week, and I was thinking, well, you know, what would I say to that person? If I, if I could sit down with each of you that kind of began that walk, and if I could say, hey, you know, here, here's where I would take this outside the service. If, you know, you get in the service and you make a decision of that kind, you're going to lay the stone down, or you make a decision that I'm going to begin a walk with God, well, I would say to you, listen, your whole new identity now begins in this thing called the cross, It is the root of all of who you are. This is is everything. It all starts with the cross and believing in Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross. And from that point, there are actually kind of these two sort of distinct pathways that you can take from the cross. And one of them is a truth identity and one of them isn't. The first way that you can choose to actually leave the cross is to enter into this pleasing mode. And the pathway of pleasing God is all about trying to work on my sin. And so it sounds so Christian and heroic and it sounds like something spiritual that Christian people should do. I'm going to please God and work on my sin issues. The, The problem is It's a self-effort thing. The focus here is on sin management. I'm going to try to kind of shower with like my sin away, and I'm going to soap my sin, salvation soap and shampoo, and I'm going to do all this wonderful stuff and do my best to look and smell like a Christian. But the problem is it's all about your attempt to manage your own sinfulness. If you weren't in church, they would call this behavior modification stuff. And if you take that into its extreme form, this is the idea. The idea is, I received grace at the cross, but it actually stops at the cross. From here on on, once I've kind of received the grace, from here on, it's all on me and trying to please God. I'm not going to continue in this new relationship by grace, but the only way I'm ever going to have God's acceptance is by pleasing him. And the truth be told, that's how some of us relate to God. Your whole effort is on sinning less, what you can and cannot do. And entire identities are formed around this idea. And guess what? Churches are filled with people, (laughs) filled with people who group themselves by what they are doing and not doing to please God. The biggest wounds I receive (laughs) as a pastor is from church people. Fair? Fair? Because there's this group of church people that thinks we should behave and act this way, and this group of people thinks we should behave and act this way, and what they do when they don't agree is this group attacks that group, and it all makes God happy. Not. It's embarrassing. Come on. It's terrible. There's nothing like God in any of that. And what happens as a natural byproduct of all this is if I can form a group of people based on what I am doing and not doing to please God, 
And if I can get three or four of y'all to come and join me, so now all of us together saying, this is what we do to please and not please God, you know what happens? We become self-righteous. We are doing these things to please and not please God, and you are not. And the natural assumption there is not a good one. It becomes a disease because I am better because of what I do and do not do. That mindset says grace stopped at the cross. And from here on on, here on on, here on, it's all about me. Now, I have to tell you, just being gut level honest, this is where my walk with God began. This is where the whole thing, this is what I was taught. And I'm sort of ashamed to tell you that I believed God preferred me because of how I pleased him. And it got even sicker. I thought if I lived a certain way, I could actually earn God's favor on me, and God would smile more on me because of what I was doing or didn't do to please him. And when I compared myself to others like you people who lived differently or maybe didn't follow the same personal creed or the same disciplines that I did, the natural assumption was God preferred me to you. It makes you wonder how I got this job, doesn't it? <laughs> that I would be so carnal, but it's true. It's true. And the truth be told, I'm probably not alone in that, in this room. There's a danger that I want to call attention to this first pathway. If you live to please God, here's what I have learned. If you live to please God, then I promise you, you are struggling in your life with trying to please everybody else. It's just a natural byproduct because the label you picked up somewhere along the way is it's all about you doing everything right or everything correctly and you are not living in the grace of God. Not in a healthy sense. This will be a paralyzing thing because when pleasing becomes a core identity marker, it always leads to bondage to what everything and everybody else is saying about us. Are you with me? But the truth is this. The truth identity marker is this. You all look like beautiful people. But you never graduate from God's grace. Ever. You never graduate from grace. And grace is what you are saved by. But here's the humdinger. Grace is also what you live by. And when we forget, when we forget, well, then that means all of a sudden that I can't have fellowship with you if you're different than I am. Because I've ruled grace out of our relationship. And so if you're different than me, then I obviously don't like you. Because we're on two different planes. We're on two different levels. And so we start talking about each other and judging one another. Now, it was a great discovery for me. Although, i got to tell you, it was as painful as it could be. <laughs> to learn that my truth identity in God actually wasn't here. But there was another option, and my truth identity in God actually was learning to trust God. And that if I really wanted to grow in this newfound faith, if I really wanted to go to where God, it was, tr it was trust that was to be the core. And now, I am learning to trust what God says about me first and foremost. Hear me on that, because I know you, you kind of tone, hone in and out, and I get all that. Listen. I'm learning to trust what God says about me first and foremost. Not what y'all say, not what the mental record that's playing in my brain is saying, not what mom and dad said, what God said. I'm learning to trust what God says first and foremost, and I'm trusting that my identity is only in Christ and Christ alone. So when you say, hey, Tom, you know, you're not, yeah, you're right, I'm not, but I'm, I'm trusting in this. So, Tom, you're not doing it all perfect. You, don't, you messed up. I know, but I'm learning to trust in this. That's my whole identity, you see. So, Tom, you, you saw you, you're mad at your kid. Yeah, I know, but I'm learning to trust right here in this. So, Tom, I see this in your life. I know, but I'm learning to trust right here. My whole identity is in Christ. And that's what the whole thing's about. 
And this is the most challenging and most impactful idea if you really take, this is Christianity 401 for me, even though it's basic. It's not in what I can do to please God. But my identity is only in Christ. And I'm trusting that what God did on the cross is actually enough to defeat sin in my life and give me a new heart in Jesus Christ. And I can't give myself a new heart. Now, there's a huge difference between these two pathways as you see them played out. And you can see this in people's conversations. At your small group tonight, sit around and judge everybody. It's awesome. You're going to love it. <laughs> just kidding. That's why I'm not invited to anybody's small group. But anyway, this, is, this is what you do. Is you just sit there and you listen to the comments. And we all use them. And you use these comments. You don't even know you're doing it. Listen to it in your home. Is that a pleasing God thing or a trusting God thing? Now, if our truth identity is properly trusting God, watch this, 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 this is amazing. If our truth identity is, is properly trusting God, a byproduct of trusting God is pleasing him. But if your true identity is pleasing God, a byproduct you will never produce, a trust in God if you're spending your whole life trying to please him. Because in God's eye, in your eyes, God is never going to be pleased with you. So why would you trust him? But here, if you assume, I'm trusting God, I'm trusting what he did on the cross, what happens is we end up pleasing God through our trust. I think the way it came up on the screen. If our truth identity is properly trusting God, we discover that our trusting God is what pleases him. However, forming an identity on pleasing God never leads to a deeper trust in God. Now, when I say it like this, I can hear you. You're kind of saying, well, that's a no-brainer. But what I've discovered is we Christians begin to think that trust, we may start here, but then we begin to think, well, maybe trusting God's not enough. Maybe God's going to require more. And so we go back to our striving and my effort and my ability to make things happen. And as a Christian who's kind of been at this for a long time, I would suggest one of the biggest difficulties of the Christian life is remembering we were birthed in grace and therefore can only live in grace. And there's no other option in truth identity. Now, there's a specific reason why we all drift back to this one identity. Even if we start out and we get ourselves going, this kind of things, and we're trusting God, I'm a filthy, nasty sinner, and I'm trusting God to save me. That's all wonderful. But then our tendency is to sort of drift back that way. That's why you have Christians that have been at it a long time who are spending most of their life by their lists of how they please God. What happens is we get going along the way and we become convinced that God's love is limited as long as I keep pleasing him. And that's not truth. Before Christ, a lot of us are dead set on path one. We're going to please God. But after a while, you get to a place where you realize that doesn't work. So you surrender and you say, God, I can't do this. I'm going to trust in what Christ did. But then what happens after we trust in Christ is we go back to trying to please. Because, but it can never be a primary identity marker. Because it will drive you bonkers. And when we move this direction, your heart gets imprisoned. You see, let me, let me put it this way. Striving to please for acceptance and love always produces slavery. Always. You are trying to please in order to somehow earn some sort of love that will always produce slavery. But choosing to trust, I'm sorry for how confusing this is, so, but choosing to trust from acceptance and love will always produce freedom. And for some of you, in this whole freeway series, you sort of been clinging along and bumping along. This is the chewy chocolate center. This is it, man. Because you're spending your entire life trying to gain acceptance and love, and you are in bondage. You came to Jesus wanting to be free, but you're all wrapped up in bondage because what God's trying to say is just trust me, Tom. 
Trust me. Why don't you operate under the idea that you are loved and accepted? Then you'll finally be free. You see? Now, I know that people kind of get confused about all this. And, and I know I've been thinking about it for a while. But let me, just, let me just give you a couple examples from Scripture as you try to wrestle with this for yourself about truth identity. Um, Paul writes the majority of the New Testament. I'm going to say roughly three-quarters of the New Testament written by a guy named Paul. Everybody with me? Guess how many quotes Paul gives of the words of Jesus. How many times in Paul's letters the words are actually written in red? Paul only uses three quotes from Jesus in the entire three-quarters of the New Testament. Now, here's the curious thing. Paul, though, even though he only quotes Jesus three times, he uses this phrase, Christ in you or in Christ, 160 times. And there's a great theological truth at work. Let me give you an example, Colossians 1. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What Paul was absolutely obsessed by was not what Jesus said. What he was obsessed by was that Jesus died on a cross, resurrected from the grave, ascended to heaven, and said at that moment, I'm going to put my spirit inside of every believer, and that is an amazing mystery. And it's a big distinction between the Old and the New Testament. If you read the Old Testament, you're going to see God was with Moses, and God was with Abraham, and God was with Adam and Eve, and God was with Joseph, and God is with the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. Jesus comes to earth and is called Emmanuel, God with us. But then Jesus dies on the cross and he resurrects from the dead and he puts his spirit inside of every believer and now it is Christ in you. That is your truth identity. You're not hauling Christ around like some little toy when you were a little kid. Christ is actually in you according to what the scriptures say. That's truth identity. So what that means is, when you're going through the trials of life, when you're going through the hospital or the funeral home or you're going to the bank or you're at home and trying to make the marriage work or the kids aren't listening to anything you have to say or your mom and dad are messed up, whatever, whatever. Christ is in you, man. That's the truth identity. Christ is living in here. No matter where I go, I can't get free from Christ because he's in me. That's the truth identity. And so, and so what it means, I have a heart attack, I better slow down. What it means, <laughs> what it means is, is I trust him. I can absolutely trust him. Tom, how can you be so confident because I... My truth identity says God hangs out in me. Isn't that amazing? God hangs out in me. Here's the second thing of your truth identity I just want to go after, and then I'll stop it. Psalm 139. God, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Listen to me. We're getting ready to jump into verse 14. For some of you, the reason you are here is verse 14. Because you don't believe it. You don't believe it. And you are spending an entire life on a label that is something outside of truth. This is God's word. Let me share with you what truth says about you. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made and your works are are wonderful. Uh, modern translation, your works are all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> you know, your works are amazing. And I know that full well. So you look around the room here, and obviously there's no one who's in the room is perfect. But according to what I see as truth identity is, y'all, all all of us are fearfully and wonderfully made. And maybe if I remembered that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, maybe we'd treat each other differently. Maybe we would see ourselves differently. Apparently, 
God thought there needed to be a you in the universe. You didn't know you were that important. But your truth identity right now says, God is in you. And he thought there needed to be a you in the universe. So when he put the sun up there and put the moon up there and the grass and the clouds and the mountains and the beach, he said, oh, and there needs to be a Tom too. There needs to be a you. Uh, if you get the updates from me or Facebook, whatever, uh, you know that one of our staff people, uh, the, his wife had a baby. We little Haycock kids here now. And so um, Lisa and I hopped in the car and went to the hospital yesterday to visit and to get to see the little baby, you know. And so we went to the hospital, and uh, it's kind of, it was really cool to kind of get to hold the baby and all that kind of stuff. And when we left the hospital, um, you know, after you do all this rinsing and stuff, because hospitals are germ. But anyway, we left the hospital, and we were driving down the road, and I couldn't help but think about when our kids come to our lives, right? And it starts out with this discussion. <laughs> I'm so glad it's them and not us. <laughs> you know, we should start out with that. But then it went to a holier place. <laughs> And I was thinking about when the kid came, well, we got three of them, you know, so, you know, Rachel, Sarah, and Thomas. I'm glad we didn't name one Leah and then find out later. But anyway, we got a... <laughs> so the kid comes, you know, and, and there's this connection that happens between the dad and kids. Now, you dads help me out here. If you don't have any kids, this is what maybe in your future, I don't know. And so, you know, dads, we're kind of... We kind of tolerate the baby for a while, the first nine months. And you're, you men are afraid to say it, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. So, you know, it's like, you know, mom, you have this instant connection, you know, because it's literally connected. You know, it's right there. And it's kind of like you're just kind of hauling this thing around all the time. And for the guy, and you moms are like to the husbands, oh, is it this beautiful? And the guy's like, yes. And they were looking at each other, no, this is not a good thing. Does it all go back? You know, you wonder about everything. And it's just, it's very self-centered and shallow, but we are men. So that's kind of what we think. And so we think about all this, and the baby's carrying around. And so, and when we were going through all this, you know, the books say you're supposed to read a story to the baby and sing and talk. And so I'm sitting on there, you know, you, what do you say to a big old belly? You know, it's like, well, uh, hey, how you doing in there? You know, what's weather? I don't really know what you say. And so we men, we try, right? We try, and we hope nobody's filming, you know, it's just in there talking to the baby, and we're going to be good friends and all that kind of stuff. And so really up to that point, it's really, all, in my mind, all about the mom and the baby. And then the baby kind of, that's ah, out, and then we kind of, the dad gets to touch the baby. And that's when everything changes. That's when everything changes. Because this baby comes out, and you grab the baby, and you look at it, and you think, oh my goodness, I made you. You with me, Dad? You think, oh my goodness, um, I, I, I was part of making you, and this baby, and the love, I mean, it's like your love blows up is what I tell people. And, and you hold the baby, and you're like, I find myself loving you. In fact, and the baby hasn't done anything for me other than make my wife swell up and all that, you know, kind of stuff. And, and if anything, I should really be mad at you, baby, as I think about it. But and you're costing me a lot. Of, but anyway, the baby, <laughs> the baby does nothing for you. And you parents know, that baby does nothing for you for a couple years. <laughs> All that baby does is cry and poo for years and years and years. And finally, when they're 16 or 17, they kind of break out of all that. And there's kind of this moment. No, it's, it's a little sooner. But it's true. It's true. And I think about this baby's done nothing for me. And yet, in the moment, guys, in the moment... I'd give my life for that baby. Isn't that amazing? Why? Well, because the baby's mine. Lisa and I created that baby together. We helped create this life. And so you love it. 
if you allow me just to make the stretch, maybe, maybe not too big a stretch, you understand that's how the Heavenly Father felt when you were born. He made you. What, what, what God says is, ah, boy, Tom, good thing he's got image because he's not going to be much of a looker, <laughs> but he's got image and he's got, I'm in him. He said, I've, I made this. You with me? That's what God says about you. I made that. He's, I made him. I love him. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put my spirit in him. In him. And he thought of you. And he did that for you in this room. Now there's no way that all of us in this room can make this quick decision to do all this. So let me just tell you a couple of things. You're constantly bombarded by what you're not. But here's what Scripture says you are. These are truth identities. I'm not saying you own them, but these are truth identities. According to Scripture, you are accepted. You are His child. You are His workmanship. You are His friend. A friend of God. That's what you are. You are His vessel. Scripture says you are His witness. Scripture says you're actually His ambassador. You are His instrument. Scripture says you are chosen. Scripture says you are forgiven. You are adopted. You are actually complete. Scripture says you are more than a conqueror. You are healed. You are sheltered. You are constantly on God's mind. And you are at peace. Scripture says you are favored. You are God-designed. And you are significant. And you are lavishly loved. And you are a child of God. And you are His. That's your truth identity. So anytime we're functioning in a place outside of that, maybe we're on a path that's going to lead to something totally different than we want to. So in your small groups, dinner table, talk about the labels. Talk about the labels you're picking up and you're living under because for some of you, God may want you to, to take another path and be free.